I'm Mike Engelson. I'm the executive director of Wisconsin Lakes. Wisconsin Lakes is the statewide association of lake organizations. Um, we do education, technical assistance, advocacy, uh, and lobbying in the state capitol. So um, I am uh, an attorney and, um, and a registered lobbyist. And what we wanted to do this morning, this talk is actually part of our 101 series, which is a, a new thing that we're doing at convention this year. Maybe you've been to some of the other ones, but uh, sort of basic level courses in all the different streams that we do. So if you're um, someone that's new to the convention or needs a brush up on sort of the basics of stuff, these that's what these kind of sessions are designed for. Um, we are being videotaped this morning, just so you know, so the backs of your heads may sh uh, show up <laughs> online. Um, and keep, them, keep that in mind if you ask any questions or anything like that, if that matters to you. Um, <laughs> as, as, the, as legislators in public hearings that are on Wisconsin, I always say, keep in mind that if you, if you testify and say something about someone, um, they may be watching online. So <laughs> um, we're not online, but uh, uh, we are being videotaped. So what I wanted to um, cover today is really just sort of a basic civics uh, primer about the legislative process um, and then maybe get a little bit into the regulatory process and I'll explain what the difference between those two things are. Um, because I think it's really important when you're trying to influence what's going on in substantive policy to understand what the procedure is so that you know where things are in the procedure as you're trying to influence lawmakers. Um, and, uh, you know, because that can impact the kind of things that you're asking for and how you're asking for them. So just having the sort of the basic understanding of how, what's the, what is that sausage making process that uh, leads to the laws that we get in the state or the ordinances that we get on a local level. So I'm going to start out very basic. I think probably everybody already knows this, but we, basically have three levels of government, federal government, the state government, and then everything else is local and kind of gets its authority derived from the state. So the counties, the cities, the towns, even the lake districts. Lake districts are a um, quasi-governmental uh, entity, so they do because of taxing power and they are uh, um, authorized by statute through Chapter 33, so they're a lot like, in many respects, towns um, or other local municipal governments. Um, they don't necessarily have, obviously, the same uh, ordinance writing powers, and so it's, um, they don't have all of the powers that a town or a city does, but they are a, a level of local government. In Wisconsin, in relation to natural resources and water, we don't really deal with federal um, water law all that much. Um, because the Environmental Protection Agency has delegated authority to manage waters under the Clean Water Act to the state. So most of water management stuff that in some other states would be handled by EPA is actually handled um, by our state government, DNR, and sometimes um, Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection, DATCAP, um, depending on the, the issue. Uh, but so we don't really deal with the EPA um, all that much directly here in Wisconsin. Sometimes the Army Corps of Engineers has some uh, permit authority over things like wetlands and um, uh, some dredging uh, activities and things like that. Um, but in general, I don't really think about federal issues um, all that terribly much. Um, Another place where I might say, you know, with federal budgets and the, um, there are funding sources that, that fund things at the state level or the regional level. So for instance, the, you may have heard um, mentioned in the news that the, this happens in pretty much every federal budget cycle, it seems, um, but there's a pot of money called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, that does pay for some stuff in Wisconsin. DNR has some GLRI grants. Um, and that uh, money was the um, Trump administration uh, wanted to, wants to cut that money out of the next federal budget. And like I said, that's been up for on the chopping block in every federal budget for the, the last five or six, I think. And it usually ends up getting restored. But, you know, we'll be um, 
interested in those sorts of things. But in general, um, we're not talking, we, d we don't con concern ourselves too much with, with federal law. Skip, yeah, skip over the state law and talk a little bit about local. So the, the, the lawmaking or ordinance development process at the local level is very similar to what goes on at the state level. So I'm not really gonna talk about it at the local level except on some sidebars. Um, because it's similar and because it's a little bit different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, how uh, a particular county or a city or town um, does its ordinance development um, is, uh, it varies, so it's a little bit hard in a 50 minute class like this to talk about that. Um, and you can kind of get the gist of it by understanding things at the state level. The terminology at the local level is different. So at the state level where you have laws, at the local level you have, have ordinances. Any questions up to this point? Feel free to jump in and um, have a discussion if you have questions. So let's talk about um, the state level. So as far as water law goes in Wisconsin, there's really two sources of authority. The one that I already talked about where um, we have uh, water regulation that usually, uh, the, most of this is around water quality issues. So that's delegated to us um, through the EPA um, and the Clean Water Act. But then there's this big um, pot of other authority that the state government has in regards to water that uh, derives from what's called the public trust doctrine in the state constitution. How many of you know what the public trust doctrine is? All right, some of you, that's good. So the, the public trust doctrine basically says that the waters of the state are held in trust by the state for everyone that is a citizen of Wisconsin. So it derives from its actually ancient Roman law um, that filtered through English law and then became part of the early, um, uh, oh, it's Friday morning and uh, the, the Virginia Compact, is that doesn't sound right, but anyway. Um, in early territorial law, in order to keep rivers um, free for transporting commerce, um, there were provisions that were written that would um, not allow someone to you know, put a fence up across the river or actually own our waters. That through many court decisions and over time it was, it was um, uh, codified into the state constitution when the state was, um, first became the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and now really says that the public has the right to use waters in the state. And the state has the duty to manage those waters for the public benefit. So that's why um, if there's access, we're all able to go out on, on our lakes. And if you're paddling a river, you, um, can't, you don't run into fences that go across the river, um, which in some states you might. Uh, because they don't have the same level of protection that we have here in Wisconsin. That was a very, very quick um, description of the public trust actor, and it's, uh, it is more complicated than that, and there's a lot of, of history and case law that um, comes along with it, and I um, encourage you to check, uh, check out online resources on that, because it is really one of the linchpins of what we, of the way we regulate our, and protect our waters in the state. Um, if you uh, Google public trust doctrine or search for it on the DNR's website, there's a, it's an older video um, called Champions, Champions of the Trust, Champions of the Public Trust, but um, that does a very good job of explaining the history of, of how that law has developed. So let's go back, get back into the basics and out of the substantive law. So in uh, the, the regulatory framework, I'll call it, that we use in Wisconsin uh, and in uh, most, uh, probably all states and the federal government as well, there are really two different kinds of regulations. There are laws and then there are rules. So laws or um, statutes, as they're referred to often, are the things that are passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. So, for instance, there is a law 
that says that there are a couple of statutes that say that um, there is there will be a surface water grant program where state monies will be granted out to uh, lake organizations to do uh, management planning or protection work. So that is a state statute. Then the different state agencies, so DNR and DATCAP in the case of natural resources, develop what are called rules, which are part of the administrative code. Um, those can only be developed if they're authorized by statute. So there has to be something in a statute that says uh, the agency will, has the authority to create this rule. And what they are designed to do is they're designed to flesh out the statute. So statutes, laws are written typically to be relatively um, not ambiguous, but not flesh out all of the details. You don't want to put numbers and things that are likely to change in the statutes, because otherwise the legislature has to keep coming back and passing a new law to um, supersede the previous statute. So things are left a little bit ambiguous. The agency then takes that statute and fleshes out the details. So for in the case of the surface water grant program, the rule says, here's what kind of grants we're going to give. It might give the limits on how much for particular activities and all of that. Those have to first be approved by the governor. Um, then the agency writes the rule and the governor and legislature go through an approval process. In the past couple of legislative sessions, that's, uh, that approval process has changed and gotten more and more complicated. We'll get into that a little bit at the end, depending on how much time we have. Um, but what used to really only take maybe one to two years now really takes three to four years to write a new rule. Um, so another example of, of a statute and rule relationship um, would be in shoreland zoning. So the shoreland zoning statute is chapter 59, sub 692. Um, that authorizes shoreland zoning and actually does set out a few standards because the legislature wanted to, um, to they really wanted to make sure that they got what they, what they wanted for some standards on shoreland zoning. So, oops, they put that into 59.692, but it authorizes the agency to write rules in, to flesh that out, and that's what happens in NR 115. So the NR is from natural resources. The administrative code is divided up by agency. So there's NR 115. Um, the, the ag rules are not, it's not DADCAP. I can't remember exactly what that acronym is right now. But um, so most of the ones that you'll run across are going to be DNR rules. So it, they're usually NR something. The rewrite of the surface water grant rules is NR 193 is another example. So everybody understand the difference between a law and a rule? Good. How does a law get made? So really great way to learn about how a law gets made. Uh, if you remember the old Saturday morning cartoons, how a bill becomes a law, it's exactly um, that process. So the first step is that a bill is introduced by a legislature, legislator and it gets assigned to a committee. So a legislator, uh, this, it may be that they are handed text of a bill by um, a lobbyist. Uh, it may be that they get an idea for a bill and they convene a bunch of stakeholders together and there's a collaborative process to write the bill. At some point, that's usually handed off to uh, an agency within the legislature that does the actual bill drafting. They have lawyers that, um, that take notes of what they want in the bill and then it, at the actual text is written. That's put out as a um, proposal. The, the agency within the legislature is called the Legislative Reference Bureau. So the, the draft of a bill usually has a LRB designation with a number 
that gets circulated around to the other legislators to see if there are any other legislators that are interested in co-sponsoring it. Um, once they have enough interest that they think this will go someplace, it's officially introduced as a bill and it's given a number. So if it's a bill that's introduced in the assembly, it becomes AB and the number, so AB 191. Um, and if it's introduced in the Senate, it's an SB, so SB 191. Then both houses of the legislature have a whole bunch of different committees that work on different issues. Um, so in the Senate, there's a Natural Resources Committee uh, that's chaired by Senator Coles out of Green Bay. There's also a mining and sporting, I think it's still called this, mining and sporting heritage. I know it has sporting heritage and they may have added forestry in there, but anyway, that, that committee is chaired by Senator Tiffany. So there can be more, more than one committee that works on the same sort of issue. So there are a couple of natural resources oriented committees in the Senate and there's a couple in the assembly. The leader of each house has a lot of control over what committee that bill gets assigned to though. So it doesn't necessarily even have to go to a committee whose title has anything to do with the bill. So we've seen um, natural resources related bills that at best tangentially have any relation to local government going to a local government committee. Um, there was one that, uh, last session that went into a science and technology committee. And a lot of that has to do with it. Maybe that the particular chair of that committee lobbies to get that bill assigned to their committee because they have some interest in moving it forward or maybe an interest in not having it move forward. And you'll see why that the committee choice is important uh, here shortly. So, but it gets assigned to that committee. And at that point, the chair of the committee gets to decide whether or not that bill's ever gonna get a public hearing. So the first, the first step after the bill gets assigned to the committee is that the, a public hearing would be scheduled before the committee can actually vote on it so people can come in and express their opinion to the committee members, uh, you know, make, make comments about the bill. But just because a bill gets assigned to a committee does not mean there has to be a hearing. That committee chair can sit on that bill until the end of the legislative session. So if you could have a bill introduced in January of 2019, it's a two year legislative session that doesn't end until December of 2020. That bill may never see um, the light of a public hearing in that entire two year process. Um, and uh, an example of that would be in the last session, I think in the last two sessions, there's been a fairly comprehensive a uh, groundwater bill that's been introduced by a couple of Democrats that just, uh, there's never even been a hearing on it uh, because uh, the, it's up to the committee chair and what sometimes what the leadership within that house wants to, tells the committee chair to do whether a bill actually gets heard. But if the committee chair says, yes, we are gonna move forward with this bill, the next step is a public hearing. So at public hearings, the public testifies for or against the bill. That includes lobbyists. Um, state agencies can uh, often come. Usually they testify for informational purposes only, so they're not um, testifying for or against a bill. Um, and the general public, anybody can come to a public hearing and generally everybody that comes to a public hearing gets to speak. Um, there have been, I think, probably a few instances on really controversial bills where hundreds of people show up that event that at some point um, they do cut off testimony. Um, but the committee chairs are actually, they really do want to get everybody that comes to a hearing a chance to speak. Um, and it, for the most part, the the legislators on the committee really do listen to what people say. You know, if it's, in, if it's a bill that is, again, controversial and generates 200 speakers, by speaker 150, um, you know, you may be able, at that point, some people may not be paying as close of attention as they were earlier in the day. Um, and 
legislators have busy schedules. They'll move in and out of hearings if they have another vote or another committee. Not you don't they they don't have to be in the committee hearing um, the entire time as long as they're, the committee has a quorum. So people will move in and out. Um, but public hearings are a very powerful point in the bill development process where you can go and have your voice heard. Um, and especially on the smaller bills that don't have 200 people show up, if you only have seven or eight people testify and five of them are testifying against the bill, that gets noticed by the committee and that does have an impact on how they look at a bill and whether or not things maybe get changed or amended. Um, so if you really feel, uh, have a really strong opinion about a particular bill, if you can make it to the Capitol for a public hearing, um, I really encourage you to do so. Um, they're good to just go watch sometimes as well. Um, and it really is a very, it can seem intimidating the first time you go into a hearing because you know, it's in the Capitol and some of those hearing rooms are very ornate and it feels very formal. Um, but the, the committees go, they do a very good job of trying to make everyone feel comfortable testifying. Um, the legislator that introduced the bill will usually go first and sort of explain what it means. Then if there's agency staff there, they'll testify and then they open. What is the difference between what you just described and a public hearing that has four or five locations around the state? So there really is not any difference. Um, there are some big bills, for instance, the budget and sometimes some others where the committee that has that bill will say, we want to we want to make sure that it, we do everything we can for people to get their voice heard. So we'll take this on the road and go someplace else and have a hearing. Do they have a forum when they're in outstate, so to speak? I, yeah, I believe for it to be an official hearing, they, they need to have a quorum. It's a big deal if 200 people show up. Mm -hmm. It's a long way away from mass. Yep. Yeah. So uh, one difference, uh, at a session yesterday, I talked about the, um, the Speaker's Task Force on Water Quality is having hearings. So those, that, those hearings aren't actually on any particular bill necessarily, they're just uh, collecting information. So a committee can do that too. They can hold a hearing on any issue that they want to. They don't necessarily have to have a bill. Um, but as part of the bill making process, most of the hearings are held in the Capitol. I mean, most of them are pretty small um, and, and don't last very long. Stepping back one, one step, mm -hmm. when, when it's introduced, it gets assigned to a committee. Mm -hmm. Who makes that assignment? The leader of that house. So in, in this case right now, it would either be Speaker Voss in the Assembly or Senator Fitzgerald in the Senate. Um, the, there's a lot of jockeying and um, lobbying of them to what committee it gets assigned to, but they ultimately have the authority. Yeah. Mike, do you, um, do you subscribe to the belief that no committee chairman will hold a public hearing unless he already has the votes on, on the bill? I mean, whatever his position is on it, whether it's, he's publicly announced it or not, he already has the votes to pass the bill to his, to his liking? Um, not uniformly. Uh, that definitely happens. I mean, the, if it's a if it's an issue, if it's a if it's a bill that that person really wants and um, is pretty firm on the language, then yeah, that happens. Um, not not infrequently, and I think probably in. In any hearing, they will go in having a pretty good sense of where things are already at. Um, but that's not always the case. I've seen bills where the, it's clear that they have an interest in getting, getting feedback on the bill and changes and do end up getting made. Um, because these bills, they're, the, the legislator that writes the bill may not know everything about the subject that they're writing because it's just not the bill on. That's just not, you know, they can't know everything right. So the hearings do serve a purpose sometimes of 
the committee getting information where someone will say this particular provision just won't work because it's actually illegal or here's the way things really work in in the the world and so functionally this just won't work this way but it would work if you change it like this and so you do see a lot of uh, amendments and i think i'll get into that in a couple of slides so yeah maybe one more question that i want to keep moving on so i don't or anybody else who brings the bill forward, is there a strategy to ter determine whether it goes to the House or the Assembly, or the Senate or the Assembly first? Um, so actually every bill, well, whether it goes first, it kind of depends on the legislator. Um, there's, there, I don't necessarily think that there's a, um, you think too much from a, a likelihood of getting it through the whole process, which, place it goes to first, because it's going to have to go to the other one eventually. Um, it kind of probably comes down to, to the individual legislators that are writing the bill. If you know you have an assembly person um, that's strong on it, it's good to go there. And it's best if you have both an assembly and a Senate champion for the bill. So where's my clock? I don't want to run out of time. So. Once, it, once the bill has gone through the public hearing process, then the committee will, um, if the committee chair again, the chair gets to decide whether it gets to this step, but uh, assuming that uh, he or she does, the committee will vote on the bill in what's called executive session. So the public can come watch an executive session and there will sometimes on a bill there will be debate um, among the members of the committee about the bill. There might be amendments that are proposed and they're either accepted or dropped. But this is where the committee votes on the bill and sends it on to the full assembly or the full Senate. Um, to Skip's question before, this is definitely a point where if the chair wants it passed, he's not going to have an hold an executive session on it unless he or she knows that the votes are going to be there or vice versa. Um, I guess if a chair doesn't want a bill passed, they probably don't even bring it to a vote unless they really know that they, uh, it's not going to pass and they want to send that message. Um, but so generally, if something goes to executive session, it's probably going to be voted through to the, um, through to the, House, to the assembly or the Senate, at least in an amended form. Uh, often there will be negotiations after the public hearing of, well, we need to have these changes and um, we'd be supportive of it if these changes are made. An amendment is drafted that's introduced in the executive session and then the amended bill is voted on. It's very much like the same procedure that goes on in any, um, you know, any nonprofit uh, board deciding on resolutions. You propose the resolution, you make changes to it, and then you vote on the amended resolution. It's a very similar process. Once it passes out of committee, the bill goes to the full house in which it was born, and then they, it goes on to, a, to, is voted on in the floor, and that full house can either vote it yes, they can vote it down, or they can amend it additionally themselves. Most of the time, and sometimes they don't vote on the bill. It can get passed out of committee and then not, get, not have a vote on the floor. Um, most of the time, if a bill passes out of committee and goes to a floor vote, again, the, the ruling party already knows what's going to happen. It's, there usually are not surprise amendments that get accepted. Um, most, the, the vast majority of bills are just voted on uh, immediately once they get to the floor. So once it gets out of committee, the opportunity to change the text of a bill is very, very limited. We really don't have a whole lot of, of lobbying power at that point, or it's, it's probably at our weakest at that point. Once it, the bill passes out of the House that it was being voted on in, so let's start with the Assembly. So a, a bill gets voted out of the Assembly, it immediately gets messaged. Um, which I guess to, in today's society, it literally is messaged like we think of messaging now. It's electronically sent over to the other house. And then in the other house, the bill goes through the exact same process. So the bill gets passed out of the assembly, it gets sent to the Senate, gets assigned to a committee, the committee does all it, all it does, and it votes. And, and then the committee votes, goes to the Senate, the Senate would vote on it. That 
can lead to a lengthy process. I can't remember if I have this in the, no. Um, that can lead to a lengthy process for some bills because it, to, the time to take go through the assembly and the time to take it for it to take to go through the Senate and for it to pass all the way through to the governor, the bill language has to be exactly the same in the assembly as it is in the Senate. So what often happens is a bill will be introduced into the assembly and assigned to a committee and the exact same bill will be introduced into the Senate at the same time and introduced to a committee and the two bills will go through the committee approval process at the same time. So when I'm communicating about bills, I'll often refer to them as AB 51 slash SB 191. That just means that there's an assembly and a Senate version of exactly the same bill. Whoever passes it, whichever committee passes it first, um, it'll, that will be the bill that eventually gets voted on by both the Assembly and the Senate. So as long as the language is the same, if AB 51 gets passed by the Assembly and sent to the Senate, they can stop working on SB 191. That committee really quickly takes up the, the Assembly bill and approves it and it goes through to the Senate. Once the bill has passed both houses with exactly the same language, that's when it goes to the governor who can either sign it or veto it. If he signs it, it becomes law. If it's vetoed, it goes back to the legislature and the legislature, if they get a vote of two thirds, um, they can override that veto. So uh, it, in the past, uh, however many years that, that was, with all Republican rule, that veto issue didn't really come up very often because it was all Republicans controlling all levels of the state government. So there usually was not, the governor was not going to veto something that came out of the legislature. Now with the Democrat in the governor's office and Republicans in the legislature, this is a huge thing now. So you, in the past you saw the Republican legislature throwing a whole lot of legislation out there um, because there wasn't a check on the other end. Now we see very little legislation happening because the Republican legislature knows that the governor is likely to veto a lot of the stuff um, that he doesn't like. Talked a little bit about that already. So recap really quickly, bill is introduced to a committee, goes to public hearing, voted on by the committee, voted on by um, whichever house of the legislature it was introduced in, sent to the other house, and then voted on and signed or vetoed by the governor. That's the general process of legislation. Most everything goes through that process. The one big uh, piece of legislation that's different is the budget bill. Um, and I'll go through this relatively quickly. I talked about this a little bit in uh, my budget update session yesterday. Um, so the legislative session lasts for two years. They were, this, this one just started, so it was seated in January. Hope I updated this slide from the last time I did it. Um, <laughs> so the, this legislator was just seated in January and it will go through December of 2020. The budget is worked on um, usually February through June in the first year of this session. So we're in a budget year right now. Um, other legislation gets worked on the month or so before the budget work and then winter through spring afterwards. So most of the attention of the legislature right now um, is typically on the budget. There is some other legislative work that goes on. They take the summer off, they come back in the fall and from fall through maybe uh, March, sometimes as late as May, so it'd be into May 2020, there'll be work on other legislation then in the summer of 2020, they'll, um, they'll uh, stop doing legislative work and go off because they're beginning their uh, reelection campaigns. The assembly turns over every two years so that the entire assembly is up for reelection in 2020 and half of the Senate will be up for reelection in 2020. Um, So this, this slide just shows the timeline of typical bu budget development. The budget really is supposed to be passed 
by June 30th. That's the end of the state fiscal year. So the new budget should take effect in July of this year, on July 1st of this year. Um, the budget goes through a very similar process as any, uh, any bill, as I just described. It gets, the bill is announced, is submitted by the governor. The committee that works on the budget bill is called the Joint Finance Committee. So that's a committee that actually has both assembly persons and senators in it. It's 12 people, so each house gets six. The majority party gets four, the minority gets two. So that works out to four, um, four Republicans from each house and two Democrats from each house. So it's an eight to four um, majority rule in that, that committee by Republicans at the moment. Joint finance has a lot of power, as you could see the power that a committee has on any bill. Joint finance has an incredible amount of power as to what goes into the budget that is finally voted on by the Assembly and the Senate. Um, joint finance holds hearings, public hearings, just like, they, like any committee would on a bill. And those hearings, they usually uh, go around the state and collect public testimony on the budget, um, there was a hearing last week, there was one yesterday, and then there are two next week. I don't remember off the top of my head where those were going to be. I think it was, one was in Green Bay. I can't remember where the other one was. Next week is River Falls. River Falls, that's right, yeah. River Falls is Monday, and then the next week is Green Bay. You can find all of that information out on the legislature's website. They have a, the legislature has a really um, very well-designed website with a lot of information. If you just Google Wisconsin legislature, you'll get the page. Um, there's a section on committees. You can look up what every committee is, who's on it, and when they have hearings, what bills there have been assigned to that, here, that committee. Um, that's a really great resource to look at. In the interest of time, I'm gonna keep moving on. So I talked about statutes. These are um, at least some of the water law related statutes. So the laws of the state, the ones that we um, work with a lot um, in, in and around lakes and streams would be chapter 30, which covers navigable waters, harbors, and navigation. So piers and things like that are covered under chapter 30. Uh, um, chapter 31, regulation of dams and bridges affecting navigable waters. Chapter 33 is the statute that authorizes lake districts to exist and gives some governing rules for lake districts. Um, chapter 59.692, as I mentioned before, chapter 59 is kind of a general uh, chapter on zoning stuff, so shoreland zoning falls into that chapter. Uh, and then there's a bunch of different uh, natural resource chapters in 279 to 299. If you uh, search for Wisconsin statutes online, you'll get a um, list of all, an, a catalog of all the different sections of statutes in the state, and you can click through and see the language on all of those if you like to read statutory language. So in the, in the uh, I've got about nine minutes left to go through administrative rulemaking, which probably is about as much time on a Friday morning that you would want me to talk about administrative rulemaking, <laughs> frankly. Um, so to, to get back into what an administrative rule is, the regulation, standard, policy statement, order of general application promulgated by a state agency. It's basically, as I said, the thing that fleshes out what the statute um, is trying to accomplish. It establishes procedures for the agency to follow in administering programs around that particular issue. So the agencies have rulemaking authority to create new rules, amend or repeal existing rules, but they have to be authorized by a specific grant of authority to the agency by a statute. Uh, in uh, one or two sessions ago, the legislature tightened up um, the kind of language that's necessary for an agency to, to see in a statute in order to have authority to write a rule um, about that issue. So this arose out of 
um, a court case that related to a groundwater issue, um, the Lake Beulah case, that said DNR had uh, a authority and a duty to regulate groundwater in certain instances. And the legislature did not agree with that ruling, so they um, superseded it by saying the, all agencies have to have a specific, there has to be specific language. So the court was saying that sort of just the general language of some statutes gave this very broad authority to the agency. The legislature tried to pull that back by saying, and not just in the instance of groundwater, but in, this is for all agencies in the state, that agencies had to have, there had to be much more specific language within the statute for them to be able to write rules around it. Now, that's as in everything legal, that's still, there's still a lot of ambiguity there and there's still a lot of, lot of uh, um, discussion as to how exactly specific the language has to be and in specific instances where, whether there is specific language in a statute authorizing the agency to write rules, um, but that is the new, uh, the new ruling on the statute. Um, so th this is another way of saying it. The rule can't be based on a statute that grants just general authority. It has to be specific. Um, rules can't become more restrictive than a state statute. So there are um, a few very specific provisions about shoreland zoning in the shoreland zoning statute. The rule that's written can't create standards that are stronger than those uh, those standards that are written in the statute. This is the administrative rulemaking process. Um, it's very hard to read. Uh, and if it was blown up to the size where you could read it, it would be very hard to understand because it's a complicated process. Um, and in, it, honestly, in the interest of time, I'm not really going to go into it in a whole lot of detail because I want to have time for questions. Um, there's a statement of scope that the agency has to provide. It's reviewed by the governor's office. Um, it's reviewed by the legislative council staff, which is part of the, um, the legislature. There has to be an economic impact uh, report that, that goes out to public comment. You'll hear about that sometimes where you'll hear that there's a rule that's been set out, put out for economic impact. Really all that means is what they're looking for is does it have, does it cause small businesses to spend money immediately? Does it have, does it cause the state to spend more money than it was previously? Um, it's not really like what's the broad economic impact of this. Um, it's really kind of a, more of a checkoff activity and I don't pay a whole lot of attention to those. After that process, rules will go out for public comment. So the surface water grant rules they were just out for economic impact comments. They'll be going out for public comment for the whole, the substance of the entire rulemaking package. Um, I think if they're not out for public comment yet, they will be very soon. So then the legislature still has the opportunity to say yay or nay. If there are legislators that don't like a rulemaking, um, they can end up nixing the whole process in the end. Um, uh, one of these, at some convention, I think I need to do a session that's just on rulemaking because it's an even more complicated process than the bill writing and probably deserves a session of its own. So um, we have a couple of minutes left before the end of the session, so I'll take some questions. Yeah? <clears throat> You're a lobbyist. Okay. How do we connect with you? How do we know what you're working on, what you're going to take into these legislators? Sure. Um, so um, one good way is to you can just talk to me and ask. <laughs> I'm always happy to um, discuss what's going on, and I'm always happy to take suggestions of issues that um, large or small that need to be worked on. So there's um, a couple of kind of very small things related to Lake Districts that um, I'm, I'm starting to work on, and also larger, grand, um, big problems like wake boats that really arose because I got a lot of calls from uh, uh, members of Wisconsin Lake saying this is an issue that we need to work on. Um, we do email reports on bills that are coming out and hearings that are coming up so you can subscribe to the Lake Policy Report 
and follow things on wisconsinlakes.org. Um, and in general, for any group that you're interested in, or if you're interested in knowing who's uh, um, lobbying on a particular bill, if you search on I on lobbying, um, you'll get the Wisconsin website that, that lists all the bills and who's lobbying on what. Um, you can find out what organizations they're lobbying for, the organizational um, position on a bill. So there's, it'll tell you whether they're for it, against it, or sometimes there's a question mark thing, which doesn't always mean that, um, sometimes that means that the organization doesn't have an opinion. Sometimes it means that they're just not ready to announce what their opinion is. Um, but that's, that's called, so just search on Wisconsin Eye on Lobbying. So, yeah. Does the governor have uh, any unique powers uh, regarding uh, standing rules uh, and, and uh, um, statutes? Uh, I'm, and specifically, I'm, I'm speaking to the uh, shoreland zoning ordinances. Uh, is there anything that he can do to sort of uh, change or meddle things that are already standing? I've thought about that a lot, whether or not there are things that um, can be done internally uh, in the executive branch, so it, you know things that that the governor could direct DNR to do through executive order, especially in relation to shoreland zoning. Um, th the The short answer to that is um, there. Uh, I don't have anything specific to shoreland zoning. There are probably some other places where there are some things that can be done, but the legislature has taken a lot of authority um, in overseeing that regulatory process. And so it's really hard. There's, there's not a lot that can be done that doesn't have to have legislative buy-in. Mary? Is anything oh, afoot, uh, Mike, about where we lost the shoreland zoning for being more protected and only going back to the minimum to becoming the maximum, uh, the maximum becoming the minimum? Um, do you see any action or ground groups coming up that maybe we can get some of that back now that we have uh, this change in administration? So certainly at the end of the process, the, it, I think this it, the, the governor would probably be supportive of that. The legislature, um, despite the fact that there's not as much going on as far as um, natural resource related bills right now, I think the legislature actually got more conservative than it was um, the last session. Um, the one of the real opponents of shoreland zoning um, did not run for re-election, and so he is not he's not there. Um, but I don't see that the lay of the land, as far as legislators, has changed enough that um, there's a whole lot of there's any more likelihood that something would get passed. Um, the where the legislature is really interested in going, as far as um, any kind of environmental laws, is in. Uh, drinking water and water water quality at best, um, and I, you know I certainly understand that water there is shoreland zoning has a direct impact on water quality, um, but that's probably not what they're talking about. The very last session in this room of of the day is going to be with um, Todd Ames, the deputy administrator for um, DNR and a representative, Katrina Shanklin, who's the um, Democrat in the assembly for this area. She's the co-chair of the Speaker's Water Quality Task Force. And um, one of the things that I think, and, and Todd's going to be talking about the governor's year of clean drinking water. Um, one of the things that I think would be interesting to ask them is how does, uh, the focus is very much on drinking water because that actually is a very, very bad crisis in the state right now. There are a lot of, a lot of people in the state who, who can't drink their water. So that's not at all saying that that shouldn't be a focus. But there are a lot of problems with surface water, as we all know. And I think asking how those issues fit into this, um, into this momentum that we have right now uh, would be important. <coughs> Touch on leaks in action and where we are in that program because it fits into a lot of what you're sure. Doing. Yep. How to take this and bring it to something more local. Yep. I'll finish that up, but Don's been very patient. <laughs> <so. laughs> um, 
my question has to do with local control, actually. And um, you know, over the past eight years, what we've heard you know, from when our community has, has tried to impose some ordinance uh, that would control you know, zoning or something like that, uh, what we've encountered is that, uh, and I think it relates back to Act 10, but my memory could be faulty, uh, that we, can't, we, we cannot uh, uh, put in place an ordinance that would be more restrictive than the state law or higher level ordinance. And it seems to me that that's a result of Act 10, perhaps, or some ruling or some law that was put in place by the former governor. And I'm wondering if that, you know, with the new um, governor in place, if that frees us up then to, for proactive communities to have a little bit more power to control what happens locally. Can you speak to that point? Yeah, and um, unfortunately, I probably don't have the answer that you want. <laughs> um, so the, a couple of things. Generally speaking, um, local governments can't be more restricted than state law because the local government has its power. It's granted its power because of state law. So that's always been true. But where state law has been silent on uh, how far a local government can go on a particular issue, then there has been, the local has the level of control of going as far as it wants on its standards, right? So what the legislature, the legislature that has been uh, in place under the Walker administration times, restricted, passed a lot of statutes in a lot of different areas, restricting local governments from being able to go particularly far. Um, so those were additional statutes that got added on. Those are all still on the books. So for instance, in, in terms of shoreland zoning, um, there is the statute now says that local localities can't pass standards that are more restrictive than what the state standards are. That's on the books and the governor doesn't have unilateral control. That's controlled by statute. So it would have changes to the statutes would have to go through the legislature first. And again, it's pretty much the same legislature that we've had for the past six years. So pretty limited. We are actually um, way over time and the plenary session is going to start in about five minutes. So um, thank you all for coming.